I want to make one final quick note where I say, and I'm like, oh, it doesn't make any sense. Why am I making my own product uh, that's not scalable, etc.? So to anyone watching, that's kind of like, well, yeah, why the fuck are you doing that? Well, <laughs> when most people make those excuses, oh, man, the minimums are so large. Oh, man, I don't have the money to start liver. So you're going to use that as an excuse, or are you just going to get it done and make it yourself? So that's what I've been doing. There's been times in life where I have been able to meet minimums. Uh, don't get me wrong, there's components and things in my products that I do have other people do. Um, like I said, currently in the process of having some of the assembly stuff that I do done by others. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. That's the current circumstances. I've directed those funds elsewhere. Marketing, getting out, going to events, different stuff. And uh, call it what you want, neither here nor there. But uh, for the current circumstances, to a degree, um, I've had to do a lot of assembly of my own products and again that's been a decision rather than make the same excuse that everyone else makes that uh, they just don't have the funds or ability to do it so let's fucking do it <laughs>This is probably going to become a pretty popular uh, recording spot. Today it would now be, I think, March 22nd, 2015, about 12.30 in the morning. Um, it's pretty typical, I would say. I probably, uh, I try to get eight hours of sleep a night. Of course, there's many, many times where that doesn't happen. But I try to let that be a consistent thing because I know um, pretty much from the moment I wake to the moment I sleep, I hate saying it, but uh, starting things up like this, I, I really don't have a social life. I pretty much... Uh, if I get to the gym for a couple hours, that's awesome. And uh, outside of that, I I work from the moment I wake up to the moment I sleep. So, you know, I would say there's many days where that's, you know, 16, 17 hours. And most days it's, you know, probably 12 to 14 hours. And uh, I'd, I'd say probably, probably about 13 or 14 is pretty typical. And that's seven days a week. And it's been that way pretty much uh, since the day I quit. And... Uh, is a little lopsided, definitely not a uh, probably long-term thing, but uh, sometimes you gotta you gotta do shit to make it happen. But just additional thoughts on the day. Um, got basically most of the work I wanted to get done. Uh, interestingly, I was thinking to myself, I'm like, you know, I still have my 401k, <laughs> and I know that's totally not a. Uh, you don't grow a business by just endlessly sapping all your own personal resources and uh, and. Uh, you know what I mean? Like not actually making profits and stuff to, to cover for. And of course, I'm making profits, have decent margins on our products. It's just, again, um, when your expenses are through the roof of trying to get things started and trying to scale and trying to do big things and uh, having a massive podcast and all that good stuff on the side. But a five-day-a-week podcast. Um, so, yeah, but anyway, so again, full disclosure, that's about eight, eight and a half K. So, um and the reason I haven't tapped that and I've chosen to take on some credit card debt instead is because the penalty for cutting into that early is uh, much larger than the small bit of uh, interest I'm doing on the cards right now. Because, again, it's, it seems like that's only going to be temporary. Um, I don't think that's going to last very long. I may eat those words, but, but uh, I think it's, it's just kind of been a, a temporary thing that I need to do. So... That's where things are at. Um, so I guess that makes me feel a little better, and I'm well aware that I remind myself of that all the time. That you know, I told myself I'm like I'm all in on this. I mean, not that I'm gonna be a complete moron, but if it takes using every last penny of everything, like I'm fucking doing this, man. So um, I'll figure it out one way or another. And uh, hey, I've survived, you know, almost a year now. So. Right? Everyone everyone said the world was going to come to an end in a few months, and it hasn't come to an end. If anything, it's I feel like it's just about the tides. Things are about to uh, start happening. And uh, so, yeah, I guess those are final thoughts. I better uh, get ready to turn in for the night. Unfortunately, I tend to keep a little bit later hours, um, usually whatever, you know, eight hours-ish after I go to bed is when I get up, and typically bed's been... 1.32 in the morning. And it's interesting, you know, you have those different philosophies, you know, oh, it's the early birds, they're the ones that get everything done and, and they dominate. And I used to always get angry at that and be like, fuck no, as long as you're working hard the same amount of time, like what the heck, what difference does it make if you're doing it late versus getting up early? And I still generally believe that, but I will say over time, th there is something to be said about the fact that most people are on business hours. So 
if you get up at 10 or 11, you know what I mean? Like you're already missing a couple of their hours. And so sometimes to me, it's maybe dealing with someone overseas. And so, you know, it, it's well worth it. And I'm, I'm actually like the good guy or like the one, the person, the smart one getting a lot more done by the fact that I'm willing to stay up like that and, you know, interact with people that are on a different time zone. But uh, in terms of stuff here in the States, stuff here locally, which is, you know, obviously the large majority of what I'm doing, of course, um, it, it does kind of start to shoot you in the foot. And, and why I do that, why I keep that kind of schedule, I think it's mostly just come from, uh, I mean, maybe a little bit of college, kind of whatever, but um, you know, I'm still young, going to be 29 this year. But I think I think most of it's uh, it's just a matter of, I just always, the to-do list never freaking ends. Like, it is just crazy. I'm, I'm largely doing this all by myself, you know, so... Um, the to-do list just never ends. And so it's like every night you go to bed and you're like, ah, I want to get one more thing done. Ah, one more thing done. One more thing done. Or particularly if it's really into something or an assistant overseas, you're like, if I got this to them now, they could be doing it while I sleep. So I better stay up another 20 minutes and get that done so they can sleep. But then maybe you remember another thing and then it's another 20 minutes and you can see where that goes. But that's all for the rambles. Um, this is kind of cool. This is actually kind of neat, like reflecting on my thoughts like this. So it'll be interesting again <laughs> whenever this all finally... Uh, hits the interwebs and is made public. Um, it, yeah, it'd just be interesting looking back on it. All right, guys, I'm out. All right, so check this out. Man behind the microphone. You get to see just how scruffy this crazy beard is getting. Trying to grow this thing huge, so we'll see how it goes. But uh, I just wanted to give you an update. I'm going to do a little thing here now. I'm going to try to do a little thing. Where each day as I put up a new podcast episode, uh, I'll put up a video the day before. Um, can't guarantee I'm going to do this regularly, going to try. But uh, to basically just kind of let people know, like, hey, what's the podcast episode coming up? So tomorrow's episode on the Barbell One Show, episode 407, is about uh, exercise selection, kind of how to put everything together um, in a week. And what the research study was done on was basically they took people and they had them do one arm seated rows with one arm, one side of their body. And then they did uh, one arm preacher curls with the other side of their body. And we're comparing like which made the biceps more sore, which made it uh, took longer to recover from, etc. And so with myself, someone who develops my arms pretty easily, but I know there's some people that arms are a, a hard point, you know, they, they struggle to develop them. Kind of just got me thinking a lot about, uh, you know, how to program for that. Should you be doing more of your uh, biceps training indirectly? through things like rows, pull downs, etc. Or should you be almost uh, losing some of that back work um, in exchange for more of a straight arm type work in order to allow you to do more direct arm work if something, you know, arms is something you need to bring up. So those are the kind of things that I discuss. Uh, be sure to check out episode 407 tomorrow uh, on the Barbell One Show at barbellone.com. Thanks, guys. All right, y'all, so as promised, this little documentary rolls on. It is, what is it, it might be April 1st now. April 1st, 2015, exactly one year after my hip surgery. We're doing all right. Here you can see a couple walls of the shed, the base of the shed, it's upside down. It's going in that back corner over there. You can see those posts getting ready to rock. And uh, yeah, that's right, to a large degree. Um, Barbell One is about to live out of a shed. Uh, this is April 1st, again, 2015. Um, I've been wanting to document the struggles of a starting business person. So basically, uh, catching you up, you should already know, but um, from the previous little vlogs there that uh, me and the business partner split ways. So as a temporary solution, um, all the stuff we were doing uh, over at his place, uh, just putting up a shed. So that's what's going on there. And uh, the main things I want to talk about, I've um, been thinking about this a lot lately, and it really kind of, I guess, bugs me a little, is that basically, to summarize the approach of Barbell One with our Recover Roller product, um, my business partner, and I always struggle with this because I don't want to make it sound like one person was wrong or one person was right. Um, there's just two different ways you could go, right? One is to basically develop a premium brand. You're the only one that sells a product and uh, you charge a high price point for that. 
or you perhaps you know set a little more of a moderate price point that kind of matches much more of what the the market sells something for and then you um, have resellers of your product now the only vendor I had taken on sorry I'm just kind of pacing and turning off and on lights here the only vendor I had taken on uh, this was back in late uh, no not late um, like June ish of 2013 was tigerfitness.com um, Mark Lobliner over there was cool and uh, we made some recover rollers for their group so I did that project and uh, quite honestly at that point our expenses to make the products etc was honestly a pretty stupid short-term business move on my on my part I mean we basically made no money or maybe even lost <laughs> money on those products simply because again our costs were way too high because we we're just getting started and you know, not able to uh, purchase our materials and things in enough volume so I kind of moved away from that um, with the business partner we went again like I said tried uh, much higher price points we've sold rollers at a variety of prices um, I'll just be upfront with you um, ranging anywhere from 40 to 110 dollars depending on what it is depending on how much embroidery etc and ultimately um, you may have noticed now I've moved the prices back to what I feel is a very good selling point and interesting news that came to me just in the last few days um, I checked on Tiger Fitness and they have indeed sold out of uh, all the rollers we provided them so I believe that means they've moved about probably a little under 300 units in about 22 months or so maybe like that so obviously I mean 21 22 months that's uh, nothing earth-shattering but to me it's like with basically no promotion and they're not even really a fitness company in terms of, excuse me sorry that sounds awful they're not a fitness equipment company that's not their core competency their core competency is uh, supplements and all the education that mark provides around how to use them what to get etc so it's really just kind of a lower priority um, offshoot product in their portfolio and so it kind of gets you thinking you're like huh I mean for a small little me like you know moving almost 300 units not even really a priority product what about people that are actually like really selling exercise equipment and that that is their core competency that's what they do I start thinking I'm like dude like in other words I'm sitting here I think to those previous um, vlogs I made for you guys where I talk about how much um, finances are struggling or how much uh, things aren't moving like I want them to and basically making it sound like oh I'm in a crappy place and things aren't going well and uh, you know now it's time to improve them and I'm sorry but to me I'm like no dude you make a fucking awesome product like Dude, just so people know, like, so I proposed this product to Rogue Fitness. They loved it. They were actually, like, no offense in my opinion. Um, they kind of ripped it apart and were trying to, I don't know. They wanted to know how I made the product. To me, because it's my baby, I take this, like, what the fuck are you doing? Like, don't touch my thing. Like, you're trying to rip me off. When I think in actuality, it was more just like they were just genuinely curious. Didn't necessarily have plans to rip me off and steal my idea. But, uh, you know, I mean, Rogue Fitness, right? Big freaking deal. Totally interested in the product. They turned it away because the price we told them that they should sell it for, they're like, we don't really think we can move many at that price. Um, to give you another example, Cal Strength was talking to those guys a while back. They also love the role. You can see it in multiple videos of theirs. It's hanging out in the background. Yeah, dude, awesome product. We just don't think we can sell it at that price. And I run into this again and again and again, trying to push for these higher price points. And you just look back and you're like, dude, fuck. You're like, it's not that you have a dumb product. It's not that it's, it's a fucking awesome product, man. The problem is that for this particular product that made in the USA premium blah, 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 business model, I just don't think that's appropriate for this product anyways. And so, you know, the options would be, okay, maybe it just doesn't fit in our barbell and product line and you just scrap the product altogether. Or you say, I guess you have to approach this, this uh, product differently. So currently, I am uh, making a next round of rollers for Tiger Fitness um, to replenish their inventory. I have gotten my cost down substantially um, in general, and then also just recently within the last few weeks, certain adjustments I made. None of this I feel really compromises the, or doesn't compromise the quality of the product at all. Um, it's all just starting to plan, be frank and honest with you, using more overseas sourcing, um, just things of that nature and uh, finding alternatives, different things for the materials that are less critical to the product. And so, um, 
it just kind of kills me because again, I look back and I'm like, I don't mean to say that I'm like this total baller and I'd be, you know, driving my Rolls Royce and everything's going amazing. Like, had I taken this approach before? No. The good thing about being involved with my business partner is he kind of woke me up to, you know, just simple business shit that I should have been on top of, you know, what are the expenses? What are you selling for? Get a freaking clue. Um, and had I been more, had I continued to bulldoze forward the way I was doing things without the time I spent with them, I probably would have dug my own grave. So thank you. It uh, definitely was needed and necessary. But again, as for the appropriate approach for this product, I just don't think uh, the approach you're taking with the super high price points is going to work. I, I really don't. I basically would almost say like, I know it's not going to work because we've tried it. Now it's anyone that purchased our recovery rollers at a higher price point. Do I feel guilty that we were experimenting with higher prices? Absolutely not. Um, and the only reason, again, it's a lifetime warranty product. And basically anyone I've ever had try it, aside from a few people that are like, ah, uh, you know, like it's just too much for me. Uh, the massage is a little too intense. Basically everyone freaking loves the thing and says it's like the best roller they've ever used. So no, I don't feel guilty about that. Um, but again, ultimately, are there enough of those people to grow uh, a monster business, to entice enough resellers that actually think they can move the product? And particularly if they ask you for your sales history and you say, oh, <laughs> when we were at more normal prices, we sold this number, which is attractive or, you know, reasonably so. Uh, and then, you know, when it was at this price point, we sold this number. Well, geez, that's not very attractive. <laughs> what makes you think we're going to be able to sell very many? Well, there you go. So that's where I'm at now. But I guess... The reflection being for a little period there, and as you saw in um, those vlogs several days ago, I was having this thing of like, oh, woe is me, you know, my product's really not that great, it's not whatever, um, you know, my business is kind of failing, I'm trying to kind of bring things back, you know, get some sponsored athletes, get more presence and branding and whatever, and kind of resurrect my failing business or whatever, and then you're like, dude, like, yes, there's failing aspects going on, but you still have a freaking killer product. And there's no problems with you being able to get the Rogue Fitnesses and all these other, I won't say other names because I don't want to like toot my horn like I think I'm about to take over the world. But you know, a lot of heavy hitters, there's no reason why your product can't get in with all of those people and they can't move a very good number of it and you can't start to really insert yourself within this uh, market. The problem is just the model and the way you've done it. You know, keep costs super high and keep prices super high or do what you really felt was right all along try to find ways to cut costs like everyone else does and uh, ultimately um, increase profits. Uh, let's see. I, I hesitate to talk about anyone specifically, but let's just say there's multiple people out there that are inventors that have cool products that have them made overseas and they're fucking slaying it right now, making a killing. And I am not at all like jealous, angry, whatever. In some ways you're kind of like, dude, you're smart. I was the idiot for trying to do everything here. Um, cause for certain products, again, I just don't think that's very feasible, but it's interesting because I sit there and like, in other words, you basically just realize again, not to be like, you know, like they're nothing special. I'm cooler. That's not what I'm saying, but you just, you're like, dude, I would be along that path too. I would be like hailed as the dude who got his thing into all these different big outfits and stuff too. Like I would be in that department as well. Had I just taken a different approach. Um, and I'm telling you. Mark my word. <laughs> Whatever I've invented so far is just the like skimming the surface of what's going on in here, what I have half prototyped, etc. Like, I'm sorry, I am gonna toot my horn. Like I got some fucking cool ideas and it's time that I, you know, own that, have confidence and move forward and and make them. Um and if that needs to be done overseas, it needs to be done overseas. If it can be done here, it can be done here. But uh you just watch these people killing it, just absolutely killing it, and you're like, it's cause they they were smart enough to say, hey, this product should be made overseas if I want to make some screaming margins on it. So that's what they do. And I sit here and stubbornly just keep trying to drive a square peg into a round hole. Um, made in USA, super high quality approach. And again, just for this particular thing, I don't think it's going to work. So moving forward and uh, kind of excited. And again, like I said, recognizing I'm about to accept lower margins, but uh, volumes I think are going to go through the roof compared to what they are now. Um, as I just get to a price point that more people can handle. And I think about the last nine or 10 months too, I'm sitting here talking about all the credit card debt I'm in and um, you know, like sales aren't that great and whatever. And you're like, dude, all these different events and things you went to, everyone was like dying to freaking buy your rollers and you sold some, but you didn't sell near as many as you would have because people just 
weren't having that kind of price. So like think of how many more you would have sold and like not mean to say again, the margins would have been lower. Um, not mean to say I'd be slaying it, but I'm very confident I'd be doing much better and feel much more confident like, hey, I have a growing business and things are fine. And I'm not like secretively sitting here like, oh, let's document all my failures and screw ups and you know, all the hardships, whatever, you'd be like, dude, you kind of like know what to do-ish. You just haven't been doing it. And again, this is all a learning process as you go. So uh, that's enough of this rant. I'm going to quickly regroup my thoughts here and record another uh, video here on whatever this is, March 31st, April 1st, and uh, just quickly go over some other quick thoughts.